Hey guys, so I had intended this to be another kind of part vlog, part Q&A, but my camera decided to be weird all week and not recognize the battery that was in it. And I just, I ended up not taking any b-roll of, you know, I have no vlog to share. But I can give you guys a little bit of an update on my middle grade book, which is that I have a draft. A very, 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 very sloppy draft, especially towards the end. I, this seems to happen to me a lot. I got to the end of it and in the last few chapters, I just knew so many things that had kind of changed a little bit from the outline, which is normal and happens a lot, that I wanted to go back and fix. And it was like, you know what? If I'm going to go back and make all these changes and I know it's going to have kind of that a ripple effect on the end of the manuscript, I'm not going to take my time and try to get as clean of a draft at, in the last few chapters as I was trying to at the very beginning because I know I'm going to have to do some rewriting anyway. So it came out to I think just under 25,000 words. That said, I know that I'm going to, uh, it's going to be quite a bit longer once I finish because those last few chapters are like super underdeveloped and there's a lot of stuff on the like illustration graphic novel -y side of it, the scripts that I think are going to grow a little bit. And side note, I'm just wondering if anybody knows this, if you have a book that is like part prose and part graphic novel, do you include the script for the graphic novel part in what your word count is? Because once it's actually published, the word count would be lower because that part is actually going to be illustrated, you know what I mean? These are things I do not know. That said, I could see this manuscript coming out to being probably over 35,000 words, but under 35 when I finish, which is still nice and short and what I was going for. So that is my update there. And I have set a deadline for myself for two weeks from now to finish that revision and get it off to beta readers. So that's where that stands. And I thought it would be fun to finish up answering the questions that you guys have, uh, that you guys submitted I mean, what is this like a month ago now? I'm sorry, this is taking me way longer than I than I thought it would, but uh, let's get into the question. The first one's from Laura. What do you like best about teaching creative writing workshops and what are your favorite genres to write in? Oh man, uh, the teaching creative writing workshops is just, it's like when I have a really good workshop, the that energy that comes from a bunch of writers sitting around giving each other feedback and sharing the ideas. It's like, I I don't know if there's any other times in my life where I've been more motivated to write myself than when I leave a creative writing workshop. I, I don't know, I just, that's, that that energy and that excitement and seeing other writers get, have these like aha moments and have little breakthroughs in their projects. Um, yeah, that's, that's it, especially, and I've taught writing workshops for all ages, but man, especially when it's kids, I just love teaching creative writing workshops to kids. And um, yeah, it's just, it's really inspiring. It's kind of selfish, honestly, because it makes me want to write. It makes me want to be a better, better writer. <laughs> and as for my favorite genres, man, that's so hard because you guys know I like, I've dabbled in lots of different genres. I, I used, my answer to this used to be that I, liked speculative fiction. I like things with like a touch of the paranormal or fantasy and I still do but I have to tell you that the middle grade that I'm working on right now is a mystery, contemporary mystery. As you know the adult novel that I've been working on for forever is also straight ahead mystery and I'm it's really like satisfying to me as someone who loves to plot because I don't think anything out there is more fun to plot than a mystery. Uh, yeah, it's just, and I'm, I spent some time yesterday actually on my middle grade mystery going through in Scrivener and looking at, like writing down on the little note cards in Scrivener what a summary of my chapters and then adding a little list underneath of here's things I need to add or things I need to change. Um, and like here's a little seed I need to plant or a hint or a little bit of foreshadowing or a red herring in here. And I just, I find all of that like really satisfying. So right now I would say mystery is my favorite genre because I'm just having a blast with it. Next question is from Emily. How do you feel about writing scenes and pages when you don't have a firm grasp on plot? Do you think it's possible to write your way into a plot? Plot hates me. <laughs> okay, so 
As you might have guessed from my answer to the previous question, I love plot. I'm not saying plot always loves me. I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble by overplotting and things like that, but I really do love plot. And for me personally, the several times I have attempted to write my way into a plot, I'm not going to say it's been a disaster, but it made the process a lot harder for me. And in a few cases, it eventually led to me burning out on that project because I was so excited about the draft, but by the time I got to the end, things weren't tying up because I hadn't set any things up. I hadn't figured it out till the end. And I just lost my motivation on the rewriting process. If I write a draft without like a strong plot, like an outline as a guide, I, it goes all over the place and I have to do a massive, probably several massive rewrites after the fact. This is the case with the adult mystery novel. When I think about the very first, first, first draft I got of that thing for NaNoWriMo in 2021, I can't remember, a couple of years ago, uh, it, it bears such little resemblance to the one that I'm currently revising right now. and. That thing is killing me. I mean, I keep talking about it. It's If I had plotted it out better from the beginning, I, I would probably be done by now. That's just how it is for me. That said, every writer is different. And yeah, there are tons of writers who they, the way my mind works is I, I like to think of as much of that stuff as I can in the outlining process. And if I go off the rails a little bit, which I always do, it's okay. Because generally I know how I want the story to end. But some writers, trying to do that in the outline crushes their love of the book. They have to write a draft and just let it be free and figure out where the characters want to go. And then once they have that draft, they're like, oh, I know what the plot is now. And then they go back and they can rewrite it and fix it up, no problem. So yeah, I do think it's possible. It's not my preferred method, but every writer is different. So if you feel like plot hates you, um, I would say, I mean, at least just try it, you know, pants your way through a first draft and see what you learn from it. Next question is from Megan. How long have you been writing and how long did it take before you were published? So I started writing a novel with the goal of finding a literary agent and getting published in 2007. And I wrote, oh, well, I spent way too much time plotting a book, a trilogy, and got I don't know, a couple, like 10, 20,000 words into a draft, realized I was in way over my head, started over with another one in 2009, finished a draft, started querying into early 2010, and that was the book that got 130 something pa passes from agents, and started a new book, realized I was really a middle grade writer more than a young adult writer, especially at the time switched over to middle grade, took everything I learned from that book I had finished and queried unsuccessfully and applied it to this new draft. That took me, I think I was ready to start querying that in, actually, I think I messed this up. I think I queried the first one in 2009 and then it was 2010 when I queried the middle grade. And I got two offers from agents right away and signed with Sarah Davies at Greenhouse, who was my agent for 11 years and I loved her. And, um, she retired at, at, you know, gosh, I can't even say last year, at the end of 2020, what year is it? Guys, ugh, at the end of 2021, she retired. And um, anyway, so I signed with her then, and then we went on submission, and that book ultimately did not sell. And then I've made videos about this, so I will link one of them above, but I wrote another book, and... <laughs> She kept telling me, you're making this too complicated. You need to drill down and like, this is three books in one. I've made a whole video about this and uh, I wouldn't listen. And that book ended up not even going on sub. And then in 2011, Sarah said, hey, there's this editor at Penguin Random House who wants to find an author who can write a series about kids who were in band and she wants somebody who has experience in band. And I was like, well, I was a band director for four years and my degree is in music education and I spent like all of middle school and high school in band, so maybe I'm right for this. And that was how I ended up getting the deal for I Heart Band. And that was my first deal and I got it in November of 2011. So 2007 to 2011, but the first 
book didn't come out until 2014, January 2014. So 2007 to 14 from when I was actually published. I love this next question. Do you ever write people you know into your stories? I remember, I, I'm gonna call out my dad here. I remember when I first, first started writing a book and I told him, he was like, don't put me in your book. I am, no, I do not do this. I have never put anybody I know into my book. I think all writers, we take little quirks or personality traits or things that we observe in people and they become part of our characters because that feels real to us. But um, I've never taken a whole human being and like, everything that makes them them and and written them into a book not for revenge not as a tribute nothing like that so yeah i will take little things that i notice and put them into my characters but my characters will become their own person so i guess what i'm trying to say is i've never written a book where i had a character where in my head it was like it's that it's that person the whole time no never done that <laughs> all right another plot question how do you find the plotting slash plant planter style that works for you when i plot i feel too constrained when i go full on pants i feel lost without a plan any advice yeah that is kind of me because i i call myself a plotter because i do really enjoy coming up with outlines and as i've said before with ip work and with ghostwriting it's part of the gig that i have to write an outline before i write a draft so it's just, it's a skill I've had to develop. But I, first of all, I remind myself, I'm constantly reminding myself, an outline is a, is a living thing. It's a, it's constantly in progress. You know, yes, it might be set, but I can still veer off from it if something more appealing or something, something that better serves the plot comes up while I'm drafting. So I will, what I kind of do now, to be honest, First of all, I accept the fact that every book is gonna be a little different and what I did that worked well for the last book might not work well for the next book. I think that's also important to remind yourself of. At least that's the case for me. Maybe some people have found this one process and it works for every single book and that's amazing, not me. It changes a little bit every time. What I, what I feel like what I do now is, like what I did with this middle grade book, for example, and what I've done with the last couple of middle grade books is I come up with like the basic three act like i know the catalyst i know the beginning of act two i know the midpoint i know the whole dark night of the soul the low point for the character and the finale i know the basic beats and i will do various levels of growing and expanding that into scenes um and and then when i just feel like mm, i want to I just get this feeling like I need to start drafting, I need to find the voice before I can go any further with this. I need to actually get to know these characters. Then I stop at that point with the outline or synopsis or whatever I have and I start drafting. And then inevitably I will hit a point where it's like, okay, the synopsis is looking a little vague. I don't know what this next chapter exactly is about. Then I will go back to the outline and I will break it out into scenes and make sure each scene has a specific purpose and an emotional change in the character and it moves the plot forward and the main character's emotional arc forward in some way. So it's, it's like I start outlining, I get a good synopsis and part of an outline, I start drafting, I go back to the outline, flesh it out a little bit more, I go back to the draft and I just kind of bounce back and forth until I get to the end. All right, next one's for Devin. Hearing you struggle with trying your hand at an adult book, would it be easier maybe starting your character young in a somewhat middle grade level and watch them grow into an adult book or at least to YA, just to get your feet wet and stay with a character you're comfortable with? Maybe then an adult book would be a bit easier on you. That That's an interesting question and I see where you're coming from and I think um, there's a few different things here. First of all, I don't think the, the adult protagonists are what is challenging me about the adult mystery novel. One of the things that's challenging me about it is simply that I had a ton of POVs and I feel like that's the right choice for this book, but it does make it a challenge and it's just a balancing thing. Um, and for what it's worth, three of those POVs actually are teenagers. They're like 14, 15, 16 in that age range. So, and then the other thing is that I do, at a basic level when I write a book, I have to think somewhat about marketability and how am I going to pitch this book. And a book that starts with a child 
protagonist and then you watch the child grow into an adult, that is still adult fiction that's not middle grade. Um, an example that comes to mind is Jane Eyre. This is a topic for a whole other video, but um, when you write a child protagonist for a middle grade novel, it's not quite the same as writing a child protagonist for an adult novel. Because in an adult novel, what tends to happen is the narrator, the narrative voice, is bringing the wisdom of the adult and into the narration and it's almost like reflecting upon childhood. Whereas with middle grade, you are in the mind of that child at that time. I'm not saying it's like that in every single case, but it's just, it's a very different thing. And if I were to, so if I were to write that kind of book where the character grew up, um, it would still be adult fiction. And it would be, it would not be the same. Writing that part at the beginning would be a different, still a very different mindset and a different voice for me than just like my, the middle grade style that I'm comfortable with and I have more experience with. But I, I don't think it's the, adults POVs that's what's tricking me about it. It's just that this is a... I just chose a... The, the premise and the plot I came up with is complicated. I wanted it to have lots of fun twists and turns and this middle grade mystery I'm writing has twists and turns in a 30,000 word count. This book has twists and turns in a 95,000 word count. <laughs> There's just more of them and it's bigger and more complicated and that's that's really why it feels so unwieldy to me, I think. All right, last question. Uh, my question is about book fairs like Frankfurt and Bologna for authors of children in YA and how they work. When I signed with my agent, I was told my book would be taken to those two fairs, but I am overcome with distress learning my agent was prioritizing other authors on both occasions. Does that mean my agent has little faith in my work? Um, I understand your distress. I have definitely had hopes for certain books of mine in the past that they would be proudly touted at, you know, Bologna or Frankfurt, and that wasn't the case. Um, however, no, it does not mean your agent doesn't have faith in your work because your agent signed you, and they wouldn't do that if they didn't have faith in your work. And I'm not just saying that to, like, blow smoke. I, it's true. Here, Here's what I know, and now I'm going to bring a little bit more of my, like, editor side of my experience into this. Uh, here's what I know about book fairs. When, when agents and editors go to these fairs, very often people who are there, agents and people who are acquiring internationally for other, you know, publishing houses in other countries, looking for film rights and all of that stuff, they often come in with a specific list of what they want in mind. Either one, they have scouted they have heard about certain titles and they already know they want those specific titles or they they have like we are definitely looking for graphic novels right now and we are definitely not looking for high fantasy right now i'm making that up don't panic that's not the case uh, but that kind of thing and that just because like a publishing house in germany right now isn't interested in science fiction that doesn't mean your science fiction novel is doomed. Picture it more like, almost like these, these agents and editors who are shopping for books that they want to acquire are coming in with, with a list, with like a grocery list. And they're looking for tomatoes and maybe your agent has an apple. And it's a really good apple, but it's not what they're looking for. That's, that's how it is. It really doesn't mean anything about how your agent feels about your book. That said, I know it's distressing because it's just one of those things where if you didn't get, if your book didn't get a lot of attention at these kinds of fairs, it's just not the thing that is the trendiest at the moment. Again, doesn't mean your book is bad. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if that's reassuring or not. I mean, I know it's, believe me, I know from personal experience, I. There was one, I'm not going to get into the details, but oh, I had this one, this one particular book of mine in the past that we just, I heard so much big talk about how the foreign rights were going to go for that thing. And I've never gotten foreign rights, never, uh, or film rights. I've never sold any of that. Uh, it just, it completely went nowhere. And 
it didn't mean the book was bad, it was just the way the wind was blowing at the time. And it certainly didn't mean, you know, the people representing my book didn't have faith in it. It was just a matter of timeliness, and I know that sucks. So that is that. Now there is one other thing I wanted to let you guys know about. I put a community post about this yesterday, uh, but I wanted to give you a little more detail, is that I, I have been dropping the ball on that newsletter, right? I was doing really good for a while, sending a newsletter every weekend. And <laughs> I know this is gonna sound ridiculous, but the reason I haven't sent a newsletter since January is because I had been using MailChimp for a long time. I did not like it. I ended up migrating it to Wix because I use Wix to host my, my um, website. And while I like Wix for my website, I don't like it, its newsletter format like I don't like using it at all not the least of which is because you can't save a draft like I, I couldn't go in there and just add a little bit to a weekly newsletter and then save it you couldn't save it it was like you had to go in there and write it and send it and schedule it I mean I couldn't even schedule it it was and I could have paid for an upgrade but honestly I hate the I don't like the way the newsletter even looked and it was just not motivating me to send one and in the back of my head for like over a month now I was thinking I just need to pick another server but then i'm gonna have to migrate everything over and i don't i've looked into so many other ones and i don't really like any of them and it's gonna be a beating to change the links and blah blah anyway so for the last couple weeks i've had a friend of mine she's been forwarding me a newsletter uh called publishing confidential by kathleen schmidt which i'm going to link in a co pinned comment below because if you like insider traditional publishing stuff from a very knowledgeable source it is so good. And um, after the third newsletter or so, I was like, you don't have to forward these anymore. I'm going to go subscribe. And I subscribed to her and she was on Substack. And I had heard of Substack, but I didn't know a lot about it. And I still don't. So yesterday, I just, I got one of her newsletters and I read it and I went over to Substack and I was like, you know what? I'm doing this. And I just spent a couple of hours migrated all of my mailing list over to Substack, cleaned up my website so it directs to Substack now if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, changed it in my YouTube descriptions. I'm, I'm trying to make it so that I've made over the last three years a lot of like freebie downloads where if you enter your email address to sign up for my newsletter, you get this free PDF. And I just wanted to like cover my bases and make sure anybody who's coming onto my older videos didn't like sign up for MailChimp or something and never hear from me again. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> so I just jumped into Substack without doing any research. I was just like, I like this girl's newsletter. I like how it looks. It, they made it actually very easy to, you know, move my mailing list over. So I did that. I set it up. I'm going to link that also in the pinned comment down below. If you were subscribed to my newsletter, you should be subscribed to my Substack. But if you click on the link, it'll tell you, I think, subscribed or not. So. I downloaded the Substack app on my phone and the more I'm looking at it, the more I actually really enjoy this as a platform because it's not just a newsletter. You can also do chats and talk with your subscribers. You can create threads and bring up like, let's talk about this. And there's just more interaction. And I had noticed in the past that sometimes people would hit reply to my newsletter and like half the time it would land in my inbox and the other half the time it would get trapped somewhere in Wix in the back end where I just, I never go honestly, so I just never saw them. And this seems to just be a lot like a more clean way to interact with subscribers, which I really like. Another cool thing is that um, I looked at George Saunders news uh, newsletter, which I subscribed to right away. Yes, that like George Saunders, like that George Saunders, he's on there very, very worth a follow. And he does um, office hours for his newsletter where he just takes questions from his subscribers and answers them. The most recent one is like a really fascinating question about how you think about your first draft and your mindset as you're writing. And he really goes into some pretty awesome detail about his own process. Again, I reiterate, this is George Saunders. <laughs> is pretty valuable stuff and uh yeah i just i think it's such a cool it's almost like a blog slash newsletter because you have these posts and then you get to the bottom and you can check out the comments uh people are interacting the newsletter writer can respond there's like really great discussions going on 
And the more I played with it yesterday, just as a reader um, and a person who likes newsletters, the more I was like, this is actually what social media, like what the ideal version of social media to me, my ideal version of it, which is just a nice calm place to talk about things that interest you and share information and have conversations with people without, you know, all of the dumpster fire stuff that the algorithms of sites like Twitter and TikTok promote and encourage, if that makes sense. I, I just, I don't know, I'm really enjoying it. The other thing I just wanted to give you guys a heads up on is that Substack does have a like a, a paid tier thing, kind of similar to Patreon or Patreon. It's part of the setup for it, um, but I, so you might get a, if you subscribe to mine, you might get a thing saying something, I can't remember what the message, it was something like, you know, would you opt in to pay for this content in the future? Just know that there's no, I don't have that activated yet. Um, and I don't know if I will, because as I said before, when I got a question about why I don't do Patreon, I just don't know, I never knew what kind of content I would offer paid subscribers. And when it, when it comes to YouTube, sometimes I just need a break from making videos and I don't feel bad doing that now, but if people were paying me and I didn't want to make videos, I would, I mean, that would be wrong. So I, I don't know. I, I've always said I'm not going to do that just because I don't know what kind of paid content I, I would offer. But I'm looking at Substack and seeing, because of all the interactiveness, I could foresee something where I might say if you pay, if you choose a paid membership, for example, I could use that thread feature or the chat feature to say, hey, every, you know, to subscribers who are paying this fee, you know, post your pitch, post your query in, in this thread and I'll give you some feedback on it. Or something where it's like more of a one-on-one, -on -one, you're getting like actual direct value for, for what you're paying. But I'm still kind of playing with this idea. So anyway, I just, if you have suggestions or if you think that would be something you'd be interested in, please let me know. But just know as of right now, everything that I put on Substack and on YouTube and anywhere is free. Uh, so if you get a message asking about paid content or whatever, you're not missing anything <laughs> by not signing up. So anyway, that's all going to be linked down below. If you have, if you like Substack and you use it and you have any writing and publishing related newsletters that you follow or people that you follow on there, please give me some recommendations because I am really enjoying playing with this app right now. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Anyway, that is going to do it for me. I will see you guys hopefully either at the end of this week or next week with another video.